to invite Kevin Davis up uh, to read our scripture today. Kevin is the chair or co-chair of our board of community ministries and I mean, excuse me, Christian education and also um, on a board of trustees. But more importantly, today is his birthday. Woo! <laughs> Happy birthday, Kevin. And also his husband Joe's birthday is in two days, so it's a whole family birthday thing. Please. Thank you for that, Susan. So today's scripture comes from Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. The waters of Meribah. The Israelites, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month and the people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and said, would that we had died when our, when our kindred died before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went away from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting. They fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and command the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Thus you shall bring water out of the rock for them. Thus you shall provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Listen, you rebels, Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me to show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord, and through which he showed himself to be holy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the title of my sermon today is Bacon Potatoes in the Volcano. Today's sermon is the third in a three-sermon series uh, that we've just experienced about mental health. Some of you will remember two weeks ago, we actually talked about depression, and we talked about um, how we need to move through the societal stigmas that people tend to lay on us when we feel depression or we feel sadness or we feel anxiety, that this is a natural human condition and that we should, as people of faith and as human beings feel empowered to get help. Last week we talked about an important tool in mental health and that was patience. And today we're going to talk about something that we rarely talk about in this pulpit at least and that's not just anger but rage. So in honor to uh, to honor that topic, I thought we'd begin with a venting session for me to blow off a little steam. Thanks in advance for listening. Uh, recently, Toby and I rented a car right here around the corner, and we went up to Westchester County for like this quick day turnaround little errand. And going up there, no big deal, you know, whatever. Um, but then coming home, oh, Lord have mercy. Somehow the weather just completely deteriorated, fog, pouring rain, and somehow that weather seemed to upset our little delicate, dainty GPS, which ended up sending us on a way that was like four times where we should have gone, four times longer than the way we should have gone, in traffic that was absolutely outrageous. 
And I know what you, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, this is the kind of traffic where you just want to park your car and walk away. Go have a little lunch. Maybe shop a bit. Have a coffee. And then go back to your car and check on how much longer you're going to be in traffic. That kind of traffic. Finally, we got back to the city, which, by the way, was also completely gridlocked. And we drive into the rental car agency right here on 31st Street, and there's a little piece of notebook paper on the door that says, System Problems Return at 57th Street. <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but did they email or text or call us? Oh, no. Scrawled on a piece of notebook paper. And for those of you listening, uh, either on podcast or live stream who aren't from New York, If you are driving from East 31st to West 57th in gridlock, that is like driving from North America to Iceland. (laughs) Right? So after some very choice words that aren't found in the Bible, Toby and I set off for the hinterlands of 57th Street. 45 minutes later, we get there, we turn in our car, but then we have to carry our bags because there's no Uber or cabs, blah, blah, blah. We finally get home and I find an email from Budget that says because you returned to a different place, you are being penalized $50. (laughs) Nothing can describe my emotion except for four letters put together as a word, R-A-G-E. Rage. You know, people sometimes say it helps to put an image, a visual image with your emotions. So let me show you my image. Travis, could you help us here? This actually happens to be the volcano that erupted this morning. If you haven't seen the news, late last night in Reykjavik, Iceland, the volcano exploded for the fourth time this year. Now, Toby and I were just there. Tracy McMillan and Joe are going there in two weeks, fingers crossed, we shall see. But it exploded last night. Now. Ironically, Iceland is one of the most volcanically active locations on Earth. So, you know, this is not new to them. And that's why I think Icelanders just love their volcanoes. I mean, when we were there, you could buy anything you can imagine that has to do with volcanoes. You could buy volcano t-shirts, which I did, said don't swim in the lava. You can buy volcanic skincare products. You can buy even vol you could buy volcanic rock jewelry like necklaces with matching earrings. I mean, you know, who would do that? <laughs> Look, however destructive and dangerous volcanoes can be, Icelanders have come to accept them as part of the creation process in their own home island. It's part of who they are. It's part of who they are becoming. And I get that, actually. I've, I've been thinking about it a lot since we left, and I've concluded that volcanoes and human beings are uncannily alike. I mean, why not? Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. I mean, we are all a product of fire and ash and dirt and earth. And like our volcano relatives, we carry their traits and similarities. Two things I want to share this morning about volcanoes. Good, good news, and bad news. And we'll start with the good news. And stay with me here a minute because I'm going to science up this sermon. Okay. The good news this morning about volcanoes and our message today starts 1,800 miles below our feet. Now think about this. Think about getting in a car and driving from here to Denver, Colorado, but straight down. Underneath our feet, 1,800 miles, is a 10,000-degree core of the earth. Now, why is that good news? (laughs) Because that swirling iron liquid in that core causes electrical charges, which produces the magnetic field that protects the earth from the sun's radiation. Don't think that's a big deal? Think about Mars. Mars has no magnetic field. Therefore, the sun has burned out all of the moisture, all of the water. There are no oceans and therefore no life. 
I mean, the fire and heat of the Earth's core produces a life force that keeps us in existence. In short, it's good news. And you know what? Human emotions aren't that far off. Emotions like rage and anger, they're not inherently bad. They can actually be life-giving and productive. I mean, they can alert us to danger, to harm, to wrongdoing. But there's also the bad news side of things for humans and volcanoes, because like anger, sometimes that molten rock from the Earth's fiery core can escape and destroy everything in its path, like what's happening in Iceland right now. You know, as we sit in these pews in New York City, or if you're sitting in your kitchen in Beijing, or you're sitting at your office in you know, Melbourne, we are sitting right now on a tectonic plate. All of us floating around on tectonic plates that are like puzzle pieces on the surface of the earth. And there's seven of these plates, and when they act, start to pull apart, fissures, cracks form, and molten lava can come exploding out. This is a, an image of Iceland, just to show you, for example, Iceland actually straddles two of the plates, the North American plate and the Eurasian plate. The crack goes right through the center of the country. I mean, it's not so different in human life. Because we all have our emotional cracks and fissures. Can I have an amen? We got those fissures in our lives that allow for heated explosions of hot anger that's been simmering beneath our psychic surface. That's a good sentence, right? I mean, that was pretty, that's a pretty good way to bring it all together. Do you know how long it took me to write that sentence? I'm going to say it again. We all have emotional cracks and fissures in our lives that allow for heated explosions of hot anger that's been simmering beneath our psychic surface. <laughs> that's right. No, you don't. But thank you. The question is, how do you use it? Which brings us to our story today about how not to use anger which is from the book of Numbers that Kevin read for us. There's that wonderful story of Moses out in the desert with the children of Israel and they can't find water. And the people get mad and they just start railing at Moses. Why did you bring us here to die? There's no water here. The livestock are keeling over. We can't drink. There's no pomegranates. I mean, and after all they've been through, after all the miracles that God has done to keep them alive, these complaints, I think, understandably formed a fissure in Moses that was just about to blow. And so Moses prays to God for help. And God says, take your staff, assemble the congregation, and say to the rock, give us water. So simple, right? Unfortunately, Instead of listening to God and simply commanding the rock to yield water, Moses lets his anger, his rage, get the best of him. And he turns to the people and says, you rebels, <laughs> you want water coming out of this rock? And then he takes his staff and he raises it over his head and beats the rock twice. You know out of anger. And water comes from the rock. Now, every time I read this story, I can't help but think of my dad back in the 1970s beating on top of the television set because those little, those little rabbit ears with aluminum foil wouldn't work, so he would just on the top of the TV, and then it would finally work. Kind of a 1970s version of this story from the book of, in Numbers. God, though, asked Moses simply to speak words over the rock, speak God's words over the rock. That way, the problem would be solved in a way that glorified God. That would, as God said, show my holiness before the eyes of the Israelites. <laughs> Moses, however, because he let his rage get to him, at, in anger struck the rock twice. And when the water came out, it probably appeared more to the people about the power of Moses than it actually was about God's miracle. And isn't that the truth? I mean, anger is about us. Anger makes things about us. Anger turns everything around to us. And that is not what was to happen here. 
Moses was to glorify God, but he made it about him. And Moses paid the price, because it was in that moment that God told Moses he would never enter the promised land. Moral of the story, anger and fire need to be monitored. Now, in that regard, the Bible just showed us a story of what not to do. But if you go back to Iceland, meanwhile, back in Iceland, we can see an example of what to do. You know, the Icelanders are super sophisticated in how they monitor seismic activity. They know where the fissures are. They know where the cracks are. They know where the weaknesses are. They know where the pressure levels are. They even know where the lava is. They were predicting this, her this uh, volcano weeks ago. You know, we could learn a thing or two from them. When's the last time you took a moment and checked in with your emotional seismic activity? When's the last time that instead of judging ourselves and feeling shame or self-doubt over our anger, we just stopped and got curious? I mean, ask ourselves, why, why did this event make me so mad? Ask ourselves, what fissure, what crack was there in my life that caused this explosion? I mean, emotions are simply information. And we need to monitor and learn from our anger. But that's only the first step because our friends in Iceland don't just monitor those volcanoes. They do something else that's very powerful, and that is they harness the energy of those volcanoes. Now, the day we left Iceland a few weeks ago, um, our cab driver was telling us about the volcano the last time it blew. And he's driving along, and he said, oh, it was amazing. My friends and I, we jumped in our cars, we ran down there, we hiked up to watch it. I'm like, you did what? <laughs> Apparently the whole town, Reykjavik, just shut down and went to the volcano to see it. So people were out there taking photographs, hanging out, looking at the volcano. And then the, our cab driver said, yeah, it was great, and we had the best lunch. I was like, what, there's a food truck at the volcano? He said, no, 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 we brought potatoes, and we put them in the rock. And they'll, no, you can't be serious. Well, he took a picture, and I'll show it to you. There it is. In the volcanic rock, baked potatoes. And apparently, if, if you know enough about what you're doing, the volcanic rocks can cool enough to put food in them, but not so hot that it would melt them. So, baked potatoes, some people brought bread dough, some people brought pizza, others brought hot dogs. He said, you know, the one thing you gotta worry about is it's still moving, so you gotta follow your food as it cooks. <laughs> I mean, I, bacon potatoes in a volcano, which I have to say made me laugh at first, and then made her, may, maybe later it made me think, you know, what nourishing thing can we cook with our rage? I mean, how do we channel our anger or rage into something productive? Now, last time I'm appointed Iceland, but again, they have an incredible example. You know, I will say this, Iceland's one of the most expensive places I've ever been. I mean, food, drinks, super pricey because they got to import everything, right? But there's one thing in Iceland that's cheaper than anything else in the entire world, and that is power. Power. Why? Because 100% of Iceland's power is renewable energy from the hot volcanic water under the island. 100%. So while you may pay $20 for a beer, the average heating cost for a house in Iceland, which, by the way, is not a warm place, is $65 a month. I mean, trust me, it's a lesson, because we could do the same. Anger, rage, it makes you want to change things. It makes you want to channel that energy into making things different. I mean, what makes you mad? Where is your rage coming from right now? And how is God calling you to channel that rage into something transformative? I'm going to leave you with one last image this morning. One of the last places Toby and I visited in Iceland was Thingvellir National Park, which is a place where, thank you, Travis, 
it's a place, it's gorgeous, and it's also a place in Iceland where you can literally walk through the two tectonic plates that run right through that island. So you can see on either side, the little valley down there, you can walk right through it. You're walking through two tectonic plates. Now, that's pretty cool. But what is really amazing about this is that this site was the origin of the world's first parliament. A thousand years ago, Iceland Viking settlers would come here once a year to work out their grievances, make new rules, clarify leadership. This is where they came every year to form and nurture community. Think about that. Democracy was born on a fissure. I mean, with all that is coming for our democracy in 2024, how can we channel our angst and our anger and our rage into something that nurtures community out of a deep fissure in our bedrock? Friends, anger, rage is part of who we are as human beings. It is a natural part of who we are. Actually, it's kind of like that song, I Gotta Be Me, you know? which you might hear as a surprise song from a surprise guest singer in just a minute. But it's a part of who we are as human beings, and that part of us can be a life force for transformation or a vehicle for destruction. How will you use it in your life? Will you let it go unmonitored and explode across your life wreaking destruction and pain? Or will you find a way to channel it into something healing and productive? Today, this morning, I challenge each and every one of us sitting here, coming in live stream, I challenge us to bake a few potatoes in our volcanoes. And then see, just see, what transformation might come. And the people said, Amen. Amen.